by recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or capital Israel. of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews had no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as Genesis 12 says God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this, and then you say, how did this miracle happen? It was the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And um, it's a miracle that it took place. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from York, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. And once again, in collaboration with my wonderful brother in Christ, Tom Fress, all over the big ocean in the United States of America, from Inquisition Update to the 95th reading and study of the book Exploding the Israel Deception. To be completely correct, it is um, the study of the book End Time Delusions that we started with. And the fourth and final section of that book is called Exploding the Israel Deception that Steve Wahlberg published as a book on its own, I think in about 2006, or no, even earlier, 1998. And then in 2006 he made End Time Delusions and put all these different works into one book. We discussed the whole book. We are now in the fourth and final uh, section, Exploding the Israel Deception, altogether the 95th reading. We are in the eighth chapter. We are going to finish that today. And as I said, we, that is me and brother Tom, who I warmly welcome to the broadcast. Hello, Tom. How are you doing? Hello, Yerk, and uh, hello to the listeners. It's my pleasure to be here. I was, I'm, always, uh, I'm always gifted to be here. It's uh, another opportunity to share the truth with the listeners and uh, to express my appreciation to Steve Wolberg and by reading and discussing his book and promoting his book uh, so that the people will know the truth. The lies that we've been told all of our lives in the churches is, is time to be revealed. It's time to be exposed and, uh, and return to the truth. And uh, I, I congratulate Steve Wolberg for uh, writing this book and uh, exposing the lies taught in the churches. And uh, it makes great, uh, a great read and a great uh, 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 inspiration for further discussion on these subjects. And I hope the listeners have benefited from it. And I hope they go out and buy a copy of this book and share it with friends and family. 
And uh, no, that doesn't make me a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, but uh, look, we give credit where credit is due. And this book deserves a great deal of credit. And so does Steve Wolberg. And uh, thanks, Yerk, for taking uh, the initiative to read and discuss this book on the air. It's my pleasure, privilege, and blessing to participate with you. Yeah, thank you, Tom. It is also my pleasure to work together with you in this uh, subject, in this theme that we have chosen. And I think this book from um, Steve Wahlberg is a wonderful basis for the study that we are doing. He provides sure. the basis, and we read the basis and fill it with extra information wherever it is necessary. But that doesn't mm -hmm. take any way, uh, anything away of the wonderfulness of that book. And we are very yep. grateful that Steve Wahlberg wrote it. And we are even more grateful that the Lord led us to reading that book, studying that book, and now discussing and studying that book with our listeners on YouTube and wherever you are going to watch these videos. As I said, we are in Exploding the Israel Deception on page 72 in 1948, an unsinkable doctrine. And we have already sunk it, more or less, but we are now giving the final blows to the quote-unquote Titanic of Israel in this regard here. Last time we stopped, and uh, we stopped also because I said I didn't prepare with the Bible verses anymore, because, you know, I love to take the... AV 1611 King James Bible, the uncorrupted version of the Word of God, and put all verses in this book uh, according to that Bible. And uh, we stopped reading it, and I couldn't read to you Matthew 21, 37 through 39, because I didn't prepare it. Now I prepared it, uh, this and the next few pages, so that's where we're going in today. So therefore, I want to go back and repeat this last point so that you know where we are into. Yeah? We here, uh, for the moment, are speaking of uh, five points um, that uh, were uh, chosen by uh, the author, Steve Wahlberg, following five arguments that only cast doubt upon the three points we said before, when other people said this and this and this proves biblically that in the Old Testament and in this and this uh, book, chapter or verse, the nation state of Israel is being foretold. We are now in the following five arguments that are only cast doubt upon these three points just listed, but proof that Bible prophecy could not have been fulfilled in 1948. We spoke about point one, two, three, four, and then finally point five is going to come because we will see that we are speaking here Point five is here at the end of point four. The most important regathering prophecy found in Ezekiel chapter 36 also contains the conditional claim, uh, elements taught in scripture. You know, our last video was called if point, 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 then. There is a condition. yeah, And there was a condition already from the beginning, even in the books of Moses. Notice carefully. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the wastes shall be builded. Ezekiel 36:33, and the emphasis in the uh, italics is added by the author. Thus, in the day that God cleanses Israel from all her sins, is that day he would also cause her to dwell in her cities. This did not happen in 1948. Israel as a nation was not cleansed from all her iniquities at that time. It had not confessed and forsaken its past sin of rejecting the Son. And that is, that is what Matthew 21, 37 through 39 is about. It's a wonderful parable Jesus tells his disciples. And just these few verses make the point where we can read, But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, 
this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Has Israel repented of these deeds? I personally think not. Now Jonah predicted, yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And Jonah chapter 3 verse 4. Yet, forty days later, Nineveh was not overthrown. Why? Because the prophecy was conditional. Nineveh repented, so God's judgment was deferred. As we have seen, the same conditional elements are also found in the regathering prophecies. Because Israel did not first repent and return to the Lord Jesus Christ, the promises of regathering could not have been fulfilled by God in 1948. Or in other words, if the nation state of Israel would be filled with Jews accepting the Lord Jesus Christ and his once and for all sacrifice made 2000 years ago in the midst of the week, the 70th week of Daniel chapter 9 prophecy, if all the Jews living in that land accepted and confessed Jesus Christ before the world, then that state would be the work of God. But because they are not, God has absolutely nothing to do with it. The regathering could not have been fulfilled by God because if then the condition was not met. Or the conditions were not met. Now, before I go into point five, please, Tom, any comment on what I just read? Well, yes, uh, yes I have comments, and uh, uh, surely the listeners comprehend that uh, there's only one way that God can cleanse the nation of Israel, and that's by the precious blood of his son. And if God was ever going to forgive them of their sins, the Bible plainly expresses that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. There's no other blood that can wash away sin than the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus, and his sacrifice on the cross. That did not happen in 1948. It hasn't happened since. The nation of Israel is still Christ-rejecting. So we have to conclude, if we're being honest with ourselves, we have to conclude that Israel is still in unbelief and they are in the land unlawfully because someone put them there that was not God. And uh, we've not only proven that 1948 and the creation of the modern nation state of Israel was not the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, We've shown you common sense evidence, scriptural evidence, prophetic evidence, and historical evidence that the papacy desired a modern nation state of Israel so that it might foment and perform a pseudo 70th week of Daniel under Rome's interpretation, not God's. God's interpretation of Daniel's prophecy is at the, at, at the end of the 483rd year, Messiah the Prince would come and he would make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, put an end of sin, you know, seal up the vision and the prophecy of Daniel. Seal it up. That means perform it completely and perfectly and roll up the, the scroll and seal it for all time. It's just like Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. What did he mean when he said it is finished? The redemption of man is finished. The salvation of Israel is finished. The salvation of the Gentiles who are now being added to the kingdom is finished. That which God had promised even in the Garden of Eden was finished. 
And uh, the Lamb of God had been sacrificed and had atoned for the sins of all men for all time, even to the degree that it put an end of sacrifices and oblations completely. Okay? You know, you know, listen to that carefully, you Roman Catholics and you Jews. Jesus put an end to sacrifices and oblations because he is the supreme sacrifice. When that which is perfect has come, the, 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 the instruction is done away with. Okay, the old sacrament, uh, <coughs> sacrificial system of, of, of Temple Mount worship is done with. So we know there, there, there's no need for a modern nation state of Israel for the purpose of drawing disbelieving Jews back down into that land so that they can rebuild their old ancient temple, which God said he, I, God no longer dwells in temples made with hands. He won't accept the blood of lambs and goats and pigeons and doves. He has already given the blood of his only begotten son, and you either take it or leave it. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. It's the lamb that Jesus or that God provided that takes away the sin. And so there is absolutely no use for a temple other than to make forbidden sacrifices. And thus demonstrating when they sacrifice animals and doves and pigeons, they don't accept the blood of the lamb which God provided. And that is the condition of Israel today. Now, listen, there's exceptions. Obviously, we've known and read about and seen videos of, of, of Jews who accept Jesus as their Messiah. We're talking about the nation of Israel is in unbelief. They are Christ-rejecting. And since always before in history, their, their occupation of the land was conditional. That is, if you do what I say, then I will preserve you in the land. Okay? If you obey my commandments, then I will preserve you in the land and prosper you. Okay? It was always conditional. And uh, it's like uh, the title of the, the previous video we did. If then. Okay, it's conditional. The condition is expressed in the if. If you will do this or that, then I will do this or that. And uh, there's no such thing as a, a conditional, uh, 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 a condition being offered to the Jews for the modern nation state of Israel. To, pr put to, to restore them to the land in disbelief, in unbelief, Surely we can comprehend that this is not God's doing. There's and, no unconditional and, purpose for the country of Israel, let's say. Like that's that. right. All right. That, that's, that's right. And listen, <clears throat> it would be far, far easier to give you the names of those who reject this idea that 1948 was the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Because the overwhelming majority of Christian churches, those churches that call themselves Christians, insist that this was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. You know, the most prominent names, they all believe that 1948 marked the, re the divine restoration of the Jews to their ancient homeland. And uh, uh, it doesn't bother them that even after 74 years or however long it's been, <coughs> there's still no temple. The Jews cannot make sacrifice without a temple. Okay? Doesn't anybody understand common sense that God is preventing that from happening? What would prevent the Jews from building that temple? Well, possibly that the, that, the, that the Muslims have a temple on that mountain. And that it would start World War III if they tore it down. Do you see God's hand in this? I do. 
Now, that's no sanction for Islam. That's no excuse to believe that Islam is a is a <coughs> an acceptable form of, of, of worship of God. It's an abomination. Muhammad was no God, and Allah is no God. And that temple is an abomination. But so would it be an abomination for the Jews to build a temple and begin animal sacrifices again on that mountain. And that's what the the entire Christian world fails to comprehend. They would rather believe the lie. That's there's no other way to tell you. They would rather believe the lie. They perpetuate the lie. They spread the lie. They encourage you to participate in the lie. They want unanimity in this lie. They want, quote unquote, Christian unity in this lie. And they say that Christian unity cannot even happen unless we're all together supportive of this modern nation state of Israel and the creation and the and the and the building of a temple and the resumption of animal sacrifices. Now is it starting to look like Satan's plan to destroy the Jews ultimately? Because if they make a sacrifice and if they eat its flesh and drink its blood, they have eaten and drunk damnation to themselves. Once again, rejecting the blood that Jesus provided 2,000 years ago. And it, it just stifles me that this is so hard for people to understand. But I'm only one voice in a world of quote-unquote Christian wolves in sheep's clothing behind the pulpits of the churches preaching this counter-reformation, futurist fulfillment of Daniel's 70-week, 70th week, thus denying that Jesus fulfilled it 2,000 years ago. Look, if there was any Bible prophecy fulfilled in 1948, it had nothing to do with the creation of the modern nation state of Israel. That's Rome's doing. That's Rome's doing and the doing of apostate Christianity. Protestants and evangelicals together with the Roman Catholic cult. That's what produced 1948 and the creation of the modern nation state of Israel. And I know I'm going to be shouted down by innumerable Protestant and evangelical pastors. And one in particular, I'd love to name his name, has just recently come out and insisting that 1948 was the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The creation of the modern nation state of Israel is, 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 a, is a, a fulfillment of divine prophecy. And that's a lie. It's an absolute lie. And anybody who believes so is just following the futurist dialogue, the, the futurist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, thus rejecting the historical fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. Anybody that supports this modern nation state of Israel as though it were God's work, God's doing, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy in 1948, creating this modern nation state of Israel, you can classify him as a futurist. He doesn't believe in the historical fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel in Jesus. He believes in a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel by the Antichrist. Not by Jesus Christ, by the Antichrist. That's what they're looking forward to. That's what they're praying for. What do you do? Well, I'm doing all I can, all I know to do, and so is Yerk. And uh, the doing is getting weary. And it's time for God's people to step up to the plate. It's a very unpopular mission that we are on. There's no popularity, there's no fame, there's no glory, there's certainly no money, and uh, there's no incentive whatsoever to preach this truth except for the love of the truth. That's it. 
just for the simple love of the truth. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, Tom, the simple love of the truth is exactly what gets me and you out of bed every morning, eh? That's right. That's what I live for every day. Now, let's go into point five now. The prophet Ezekiel, let's just see my mic works, yeah. The prophet Ezekiel declared, quote, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people. Thou shalt ascend and come upon the people that are gathered out of the nations. And it shall come to pass at the time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. I will reign upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone, and they shall all know, or they shall know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel 38 verses 1, 2, 8, 9, 12, 18, 22 and 23, and I'm going to read it as it is written in the King James Bible. Again, and the word of the Lord came upon me, saying, Son of man, Set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee, to take spoil and to take prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods and that dwell in the midst of the land. And it shall come to pass at the same time, when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands, and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain, and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself, and sanctify myself, and will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Chapters five of the late, or chapter, sorry, chapter five of the late great planet Earth is called Russia is a Gog. There, author Hal Lindsay applied the words of Ezekiel chapter 38 to the restoration of Israel in 1948, and then to a final Middle East battle between Russia and the Jewish nation. Yet, the explosive truth is that the book of Revelation actually applies Ezekiel's prophecy to a global event that will occur at the end of the millennium. Quintessence of the sentence. Truth Stop is and Ezekiel's think about that. Yeah. Truth is Ezekiel's prophecy will occur at the end of the millennium. Are we at the end of the millennium today, Tom? No. I don't they think so. They talk about this Gog and Magog war is soon to be fought, and the Bible plainly, clearly, and repeatedly teaches that the Gog and Magog war takes place after the millennial reign of Christ. Now, now how do you explain that? How can all of Christendom with all of its wonderful doctors of divinity, all of its uh, uh, cherished uh, sages behind the pulpits of the churches, those who go to the prophecy conferences every time the doors open, how can they study prophecy day in and day out and miss the clear teaching of the scripture that the Gog and Magog war doesn't occur until after the millennium? I'll tell you what, Hal Lindsey must be a Jesuit priest. 
Hal Lindsey and his late great planet Earth wouldn't make good kindling for a fire. And yet, when I was coming up, uh, that was the most inspirational book I had read to this point. What a crime. What a lying wonder is that book, The Late Great Planet Earth, and Hal Lindsey to boot. You know, I don't like to name names. I don't like to start wars. But Hal Lindsey, in the reckoning of God's justice, is a prophetic deviant. Okay? He is a wolf in sheep's clothing, and he corrupted whatever good pastors there may have been. They all bought his book, they all read it, and they all believe it. And it's a lie from stem to stern. Morning, noon, and night, cradle to grave. A lie. A futurist lie. This is straight out of the Jesuit futurist playbook. And uh, Hal Lindsey comes with all kinds of accolades about being a Hebrew scholar and a, a Latin or uh, a Latin scholar and a Greek scholar, and, uh, oh, his, his self-proclaimed uh, uh, qualifications for writing this book. Uh, no one's a greater cheerleader for Hal Lindsey than Hal Lindsey. But his book is trash. It's worse than trash. It's lethal poison. And uh, it's all based on the premise, the, the futurist premise that the 70th week of Daniel is not yet fulfilled. In a sense, in a very real sense, Hal Lindsey denies that Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. Therefore, Jesus could not be the Messiah because that's what qualifies the Messiah. If he fulfills the 70th week of Daniel, he is the Messiah that Daniel prophesied to come. At the end of the 400 and 83rd year, seven years to go, it was his ministry, Jesus' ministry on the earth, seven-year period of time, the 70th week of Daniel, Jesus fulfilled, and the written record, the written historical record of that seven-year period is the New Testament. That's what it's about. That's what it was all about. But how Lindsay's smarter than God, see? He says the 70th week of Daniel is future, in the long distant future. Still hasn't been fulfilled. It's never going to be fulfilled. God is uh, in the works, and uh, he's not going to let the Antichrist of Rome fulfill a, a, a fake version of the 70th week of Daniel. No, God is going to play interference until God's people come out of their deception, their delusion, this futurist delusion, this counter-reformation, Jesuit-inspired future fulfillment of the, of the 70th week of Daniel and return to the historical fulfillment in Christ Jesus, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come and redeem man from his sin. I can't express what I really think of Hal Lindsey and everyone like him. And it's uh, high time God's people wake up to the charlatans behind the pulpits of our churches, the experts, the doctors, the lawyers, uh, the liars behind the pulpits of the churches in this country and around the world. It's time for the truth to be told. Back to you, Yerk. Very interesting, of course, is Tom, that this book, as you can see here on top, is published by Zondervan Books. Zondervan is Rupert Murdoch. Yep. The owner, Knight of St. Gregory. Knight of St. Gregory. Papal Knight. He a works for the Pope. Papal Knight who works for the Pope and who is the owner of the whole Fox conglomerate. That's worldwide. right. The yeah. greatest press magnate in the United States, if not the world. The most yeah. powerful, the most powerful media magnate there ever was. 
so far our advertisement for that book, which was not an advertisement. But you know, you sometimes have to know the lie to understand and love the truth even more. Now in chapter 2 of this book, speaking of exploding the Israel deception, we discovered how Matthew took Hosea 11.1, 1, which originally applied to the nation of Israel and then declared it fulfilled in Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 2 verse 15. We read, And was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son? We also saw Paul made a similar Old Testament to New Testament application, when he applied the seed of Abraham, which was definitely Israel, to one, which is Christ, in Isaiah 41.8 and Galatians 3.16, which read, But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now fasten your seat belts. The book of Revelation does the same thing with Ezekiel chapter 38. Revelation chapter 20 verses 7 through 9 says, quote, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. The major elements are the same. Both Ezekiel chapter 38 and Revelation chapter 20 speak about Gog, Magog, a great army, a final gathering for battle against Jerusalem, and fire from heaven. Yet, Revelation chapter 20 applies these things to the end of the millennium, to a global Gog and Magog, and to a final global battle against the camp of the saints in the beloved city, which is the new Jerusalem, which we read in Revelation chapter 3 verse 12, 21 verse 10, and in Hebrews 12, 22, where we read, quote, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, says Hebrews 12, 22, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Thus, Revelation chapter 20 takes what originally applied to the literal Jewish nation and then applies it to a final global battle against the saints of Jesus Christ who are inside the new Jerusalem at the end of the millennium. Now why does Revelation do this? For the same reason we discussed in chapter 3 of this book. So that the word of God will not be made of none effect through the unbelief of many natural Jews. As we can read, in Romans chapter 9 verse 6, where we read, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. And we spoke about that abundantly in the past. God did promise in Ezekiel chapter 38 and in Zechariah chapter 14, that he would defend Israel and Jerusalem during a final battle. 
and he will. He will defend his Israel in the spirit, which will dwell inside the new Jerusalem at the end of the millennium. According to Revelation chapter 20 verses 7 through 9, this is how Ezekiel chapter 38 will be fulfilled. Therefore, the big question is, are we willing to accept the New Testament application of Old Testament prophecies? If not, then we are not being faithful to the entire Word of God. If not, then we listen to man instead of God. We listen to the Pope, we listen to the Roman Catholic Church, we listen to the Jesuits instead of our Father in Heaven. On April 15, 1912, at 2.20 a.m., the unsinkable Titanic was fully underwater. About a third of her passengers were in lifeboats, while the majority were on their way to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. How about us? Will we abandon the 1948 ship before it is too late? Our captain is now pleading Get into the lifeboats. Yes, our God is now pleading. Revelation chapter 18 verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Our captain is pleading, get into the lifeboats, and our father is pleading, get out of her, my people. If we refuse, we may go down to the bottom of the sea, or we will burn in hell eternally. And this finishes this chapter. Tom, I think you have some final concluding Well, certainly I do. Well. Yes, certainly I do. And uh, clearly now the listeners have heard with their own ears and seen with their own eyes the scriptures, the prophetic scriptures in the Bible, God's holy word, that the Gog and Magog war takes place after the millennial reign of Christ. It takes place after the millennial reign of Christ. A long time from now. But what's all the talk in the churches? that the Gog and Magog war is just right around the corner. So certainly they're not going to allow nothing to occur. They must fulfill their present day Gog and Magog war to maintain any credibility among the deluded Christian world. So they're going to foment another war that's going to appear for all practical purposes to be the fulfillment of the Gog and Magog War. They're going to do the same thing with the Magog and Magog War that they did during the First World War in persecuting the Jews and establishing a worldwide government. And the Second World War, which was just a continuation of the First World War, to create a modern nation state of Israel and force the Jews by persecution and Holocaust to move down there so that there would be a natural desire for a temple and the resumption of animal sacrifices in a totally unbelieving Jewish nation. Now, right now, Russia is at war with Ukraine. Now, I'm not making any predictions. I'm not a prophet. But is this the beginning of the manipulation and the fomentation and the man-made fulfillment of the Gog and Magog war before the millennium? Listen, now you know what good the prophecy conferences are. This is where they cook up all this crap at the prophecy conferences. And you must know that if your pastor is looking for support and financial uh, support to go to a prophecy conference and take an entourage of people with him to go to a prophecy conference, when they come back, 
They're all diluted. Okay? Trust no pastor that's been to a prophecy conference. You're going to be an instrument in the fulfillment of a false prophecy in the churches. I'm telling you, I've got more than just a few reasons to tell you the worst place in the world for a man of God is in a church. Satan is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it shouldn't surprise anybody that his ministers, Satan's ministers, are transformed into ministers of righteousness. Oh, they look to be Christian. They preach Christianity. They love Jesus so much, but they're preaching you lies morning, noon, and night. False prophets, blind leaders of the blind, they're condemned by their own mouths. Their, their lies will find them out. Everything that is said in the said and done in the dark is going to be exposed. And God's judgment is going to fall upon these lying wonders behind the pulpits of our churches. I don't want any of my listeners or York's listeners to be victims of God's righteous judgment when it falls upon these false pastors and these false churches that are leading the whole world astray. If you ever had an excuse, a legitimate excuse to get out of the churches, here it is. They're all corrupted by this futurist, phony 70th week of Daniel and this near to near today fulfillment of the Gog and Magog war. They're all instruments in Satan's designs to deceive God's people. And they dare call themselves Christians. What a horror. Have I awakened the spirits of any slumbering Christians today? Has the Holy Spirit spoken to your heart and witnessed to you the truth of what we're saying? Again, I thank Steve Wolberg for having the courage to bring this truth to light. Write a book and take a stand and risk the, the consequences of telling the truth to a world deluded by lies. Jesuit, Roman Catholic, counter-Reformation lies. And thanks for your, having this program and invite me to participate. Thanks, Yerk. The great seal of the United States. And that great seal of the United States has on it Novus Order Seclorum. A new order for the centuries, for the ages, forever. So confident were that our founders and their idea about one generational responsibility one to the next, that they were confident that our country, that what they were putting forth would exist for the ages. For the ages. That was the challenge they gave us. That is the responsibility that we have. And for a couple of hundred years or more, that has always been the case. We're here today because we believe that, and we believe that the public policy that we put forth, the legislation we put forth should result in public policy that makes the future better. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue, to move forward for the American people. Now watch this drive. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful, and so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people, and neither do we. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. 
He challenged us to engage in dialogue, to move forward for the American people. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. It's the third time I've said that. I'll probably say it three more times, see? In my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda. <laughs>